Luke chapter 17, you follow along as I begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says this, Then he said unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast, and he cast into the sea, than he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves, if thy brother transpass, uh, transpass against thee, Rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he transpass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye may say unto this sycamore tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in a seed, it should obey you. But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, would say unto him, By and by, where, when he is come from the field, go and sit down to me. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful for the privilege we have to worship you this morning. We're grateful for the great music we've heard. And encourage it, Lord, now at this time, as we take these last few moments and examine your word, would you challenge us? Father, today is an extremely practical message. Father, inevitably something each and every one of us who need or will need at some point. Father, I pray you'd help it to be simple, help it to be clear. And Father, because it is from the word of God, may we listen on purpose today. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. In these next few weeks, we're still in the book of Luke, but the uh, chapter 17 of Luke, basically what Jesus does is he goes through and he kind of, he's teaching. We know in the first phrase, he speaks to his disciples. Now, this was not just the apostles. This is all who would follow Jesus. So he's speaking to followers of Jesus, and he gives several things that he wants them to do. Basically, he's talking about the coming kingdom. We could even make the application of really the way we should act in the church age. And he says, there are several things that I want you to offer. I want you to be givers of grace. So the next four weeks, we'll go through this idea of givers of grace. Today, I want to talk about this idea. Givers of grace understand forgiveness. Givers of grace understand forgiveness. Now, would you agree with me that we live in 21st century America? We live in a culture where we are easily offended, aren't we? Just a tad bit. I mean, we sit, my, my daughter picks at me, we'll sit down at a restaurant, I'll look at her, where you stop judging me. I mean, just like that. I'm like, I'm not judging, I'm observing. There's a big difference there, right? right? But it's just almost immediate that, you know, you can't say this, you can't think this, and please don't get me wrong, I think we should be gracious and kind, and we should not be out to offend people. But I think we live in a day, and instead of being rivers of grace, man, we, we're just ready for justice, all right? So, someone cuts you off on the road, what do you want to do? Some of you are already angry just thinking about it. I said, mm, you know, this morning, so, you know, someone messes up your food at the restaurant, what do you want to do? Can I warn you on that one, all right? You give it back, they cook it. It may come back with more than you wanted. Just a warning, all right? You'll figure that out later, all right? But you know, it's amazing how we live in this day where we immediately and often overreact. I read the story this week of a, a woman. The, Bible, uh, the story says that 11-year-old Matthew was warming up a pitcher before a friendly game of Little League Baseball when apparently, underestimating his own strength, he lobbed a ball and it flew straight over the pitcher's head and hit Elizabeth Lloyd, who was sitting nearby in the face. The young man ran over quickly to see if she was okay, at which point she allegedly shrugged it off and told the kid, ah, these things happen. I know if balls are going tossed around, you should be prepared maybe to get hit now and then. But apparently, Lloyd changed her mind. Because fairly soon after the ordeal, this young boy began receiving threatening letters from her on a regular basis. Perhaps she was just blowing off steam, that the way most of us do, but mercilessly harassing an 11-year-old boy. But two years later, the situation escalated, and she sued the young boy for a mind-boggling $500,000. In her suit, her allegation is that his throw was intentional and reckless, and then the young boy assaulted and battered her. Apparently, it wasn't so much a bad throw as a really good throw. When the lawyer came back, he said, what do you want us to take from him? His bicycle? Now, most of us look at that story and say, this woman's crazy, all right? It's two years later, I can't even share the hold up in court. My point is, we, we, we look at that and think it's nuts. That's kind of how we react in a lot of areas today. We see something and we're immediately ready just to just overreact. Now, 
we look at this and we understand that God is speaking to Pharisees and to disciples, but really what he's looking at is he's teaching. He's looking for the future leaders of his church. He's looking at a lot of young people who are learning or newly saved or people who are new to Christianity, and he's, he's nervous about the, all the different points of view and how simple offenses or the way we react could really hurt some people and hurt the future of the church. Let me encourage you at this point. The core to the Christian growth and success of enjoying God's grace in our everyday lives begins with forgiveness. I want to look at three things today from this passage that I think are important. Let's look at number one, a very simple thing, the reality of offenses. In verse 1 of chapter 17, then he said unto his disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. First point, all right, we will get offended. All right, I'm going to ask a politically incorrect question, all right? In the last year, how many of you say somehow you've been hurt or offended? Some of you are going to raise your hand. I don't ever worry about it, all right? Some of you have no idea what's going on right now, but that's okay, all right? Here's the point. For some of us, man, we immediately do. I can't believe they did that. I can't believe they said that. Look at the way they looked at me. And why would they wear that shirt? And all these different things, we immediately get offended. Now, this passage simply states, please understand, there will be times you will be offended. We live in a sin-sick world. We live amongst humans. So unfortunately, offense is going to come. If you're married, bad news, offense is going to come. All right? You're, 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 you're married to an imperfect person. Now, some of you are saying, yeah, they're more imperfect than you think. Anyway, we live in an imperfect world around imperfect people. You're going to get offended at some point. We understand. That's, that's the simple principle he says here. It's going to happen. So let's be realistic about it. I'm going to look at the second point, though. We can, if we're not careful, allow these offenses to control us. If we're not careful, we can allow an offense to control us. Now, in, in a serious point, let me think, why don't you think about something? Maybe there's somebody in this room that for 10, 20, 30 years has held an offense against somebody 30 years old. Maybe they're older than 30 years, but you know, the fence is 30 years old. I didn't realize I said that wrong. You have held this grudge for 30 years, and you say, when I get to see them, I hope they don't look at me. I hope they don't do this. And, and you're overwhelmed. And by the way, please understand me. It may be a legitimate hurt. I'm not talking silly stuff here. I'm talking someone may have really legitimately hurt you. And for years, you've allowed it to consume you. And something they did, sometimes inadvertently, sometimes on purpose, you know what, is controlling you. It's not controlling them. You're angry. You know what I've learned a long time ago? My anger and bitterness towards so-and-so doesn't bug them one bit. When you get angry at somebody and you don't tell them, at nighttime when you're awake at three in the morning, right? What are they doing? They have no idea. They're loving life, sleeping, and you're sitting there, and your heart's pumping, and your smartwatch is saying, stop stressing, all these things, right? And you're, you're going nuts. You're like, oh, if I could only see that person. You've already planned what you would do, all right? Some of it's illegal, so you can't state it, all right? You're just consumed with it. Can I tell you on a serious note? That can control you the rest of your life. It can literally define who you become. Hey, we're going to get offended. But I don't have to allow that thing or that person to control me or to decide who I'm going to be. Now, give me a thought. Sometimes the, the offense is simply misunderstanding. And so don't make it bigger than it needs to be. I want you to see this verse. Titus 1, verse 15. Under the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and in believing is nothing pure. But even the mind and conscience is defiled. Now, here's the first phrase. Under the pure, all things are pure. Here's simply what that verse means. It doesn't actually talk about moral purity. He says, if my mind is filled with anger and frustration, then guess what? That's what I'm going to assume. So here's the best way to illustrate it. I'm walking through church and I hear somebody say something. If my mind is not pure, I'm going to assume it was negative because I, because my mind is not pure, could have only said that in a negative way. So I will see everything through my anger. So I'm walk, some, walk, someone walks down the hallway, hey, how you doing? Oh, really? You're going to say it that way? And that's how it starts. By the way, I'm not kidding, all right? You should have seen the way they looked at me. Their right eye was twitching and everything, all right? It's amazing. And when we get consumed, why? Because our mind is filled with so much frustration. It's not pure. It's not clean. 
So when things happen, I can't view the person as just being ignorant or silly or a mistake because it has to be. I don't know the person's name. I don't know where they came from, but they did it on purpose. We can make it too big. Now, that's for simple things. But let me be honest with you. Sometimes people are just purposely going to come out and try to be intentional. Be careful not to allow that person to have too much control over you. So what do we do with that? Well, actually, before we go to that point, I want to share another thought that I found interesting in this passage. Number two, there's the warning to the offender. All right. In the second half of verse one, it says, but woe unto him through whom they come. Verse two, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he's cast into the sea that he should offend one of these little ones. Let me explain what Jesus is saying here. All right. Remember the story. Remember the context. There's a lot of people listening. Uh, sometimes, remember, if you go back just a few chapters to see the conversation is still taking place. He had just gone, and the publicans and sinners had come to him. So there's unsaved people. There's religious people. There's newly saved people. There are young believers. And so the idea when he says if they offend these little ones, he's actually not talking about children. He's talking about uh, immature, ignorant, those who don't really know a lot. Or those who are seeking truth, and so they're, they're, they don't know all the details of what's going on. And maybe, like for instance, someone comes to church here, and they're looking for truth. And they come in, and, and someone decides that, uh, well, they're in my seat, or this or that. And we decide to make a really big deal about it. And that person says, you're kidding me? And they walk out. That's what it's talking about. Let me tell you something. I hope no one would ever leave our church over something as silly as that. I hope they'd never be given the opportunity to leave over something as silly as that. Find a different chair, all right? Uh, find some other place. My point is this. Do you know what I say? If someone comes in you don't know them, go get to know them. Welcome them. Make them feel at home. Let them know how glad you are that they've come to church because you know what? They may be seeking for the truth of Jesus, and you could be the one to make them comfortable in here. It may be the one help for them to find the truth. And he says, listen, it's better for you than a millstone. I didn't get a picture of it, but in the old days, they would use these stones to crush some seeds to make olive oil. They weighed tons. He says, better for you that you hang a rock that weighs that much. Basically, it's better for you to be drowned at the bottom of the ocean to offend one of them. Did you catch this? I'm just going to. I'm going to take a second, because in a moment we're going to talk about forgiveness, the harder part of the message, all right? But let me just encourage you. Point number one, recognize your influence. Recognize your influence. There are so many times that because we're offended, because of this or because of that, we, we act in a way that can just hurt and destroy people. And I hope we wouldn't do that. I hope we wouldn't allow something like that to be something that could cause pain. Let me give you an example of an influence, okay? I'm a dad, and throughout my life, inevitably, and I grew up in a good home, a preacher's home. That doesn't always make it good, but a, a good home with great, with great parents. I had a good life. I have nothing in my childhood that I can look back and say, my parents did this, my parents did this. I, I don't have that in my life. Some of you do. I really, the Lord really blessed me growing up. But you know, inevitably, somebody and its situation could come, and I could allow that situation to be the problem, the thing I hate. Let me give you an example. A lot of preachers' kids, when they grow up, when they get old enough, they don't really want much to do with church. And there's been all kinds of debate. Why? Why don't they want anything to do? Well, the preacher's kids are the worst out there. Eh, I get around the deacon's kids. You don't know. I mean, uh, all right, I'm kidding, all right? I'm sorry, John. No, I just <laughs> in seriousness. I, we, we, they're not always, but here's the point. When we, we start looking at it, you know what I've learned personally? Sometimes the parents are hypocritical. Sometimes the church just rips the family apart and the kids want nothing to do with it when they get older. Sometimes it's one kind, and I tell you, one of the things that I've learned, I, I told my wife this, I, in our home, there's only one of us that wasn't a preacher's kid. That's my wife, all right? The rest of us, me and my kids, were all preacher's kids. You know what the preacher's kids know a lot? A lot more than I do. My parents kind of me, you, my kids kind of, you know, this is, say, this is, they're not gossiping. Did you hear this? Is this true? You know why? Because they hear it all. Now, 
as a father, I can allow that to really upset me, and I can consume me, and I can get angry, which then, much what, guess what, makes my kids angry. And they may ultimately make my grandkids angry. And I can allow it to consume me, or I can say, you know what, and I can deal with it correctly. Some of you have things in your past, legitimate struggles, but they've consumed your whole life. They've identified you, and now they've been fed off to your children with the same struggle. And so I hope and encourage you, as he says in this passage, recognize your influence. You have no idea what a comment, something that could be made that could so hurt someone else. Have we ever considered the influence that we, we have on others around us and younger children, the next generation of church leaders, those seeking the truth? Let me encourage you in this verse, Hebrews 12, 15, looking diligently, I've seen a man fail of the grace of God. I've seen a root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. So what do we do? Number two, remember what is important. A simple thing. If I've been hurt, remember what's important. Number one, the cause of Christ. It's so much more important than anything that might offend me. Number two, the heart of the next generation. Don't you want the next generation to see you as someone who loves God and loves church? Don't you want the next generation to say, man, I want to love God like he does. I want to love God like she does. I, that's the influence we have. We can have that kind of influence. They say, man, I want to know God like he does because look how excited he is. Or, or I'm the person over there, oh, I don't like that song. I don't like this. I don't like that. Yeah, Can't wait to be like that, Christian, right? Ken Davis, a comedian I, I, I listen to, um, he jokes about this. He says this, that uh, churches should be on such, uh, such enjoyable places to go for worship. That the world should be beating down our doors to get into it. He said, but did you ever meet a Christian? That I think they forgot they're saved. I've been saved for 45 years and it's been wonderful, right? <laughs> Tell your face. You know, the world looks at us and says, I don't want any of that. No one sees in anger. I said, well, I can't wait to go there. No. The influence we have to remember the Im impact we can have for the cause of Christ in the heart of the next generation. But then a question, is our hurt or are we important enough to destroy all the influence that God has given to us? So number three, I want us to look at the response to the offenses. How do I respond when I'm offended? All right, let's go down and look at the passage. Verse three, take heed to yourselves if thy brother transpass against thee. Rebuke him, and if he for repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if he had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, he might say unto this sycam um, sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. So here's what he says, first of all, if you've been hurt, Rebuke the person. Now, let me explain. Rebuke seems like a pretty strong word, doesn't it? And uh, rebuke, I'm going to tell you what I, what, what I think. I'm going to give you peace in my mind. That's not the definition of rebuke, all right? Give him a peace in my mind. Most of us can't afford it. But um, here's simply what it means. Number one, deal with the offense. Deal with the offense. So here's what I'm supposed to do. I am supposed to go to the person who I know or I believe has offended me, and I'm supposed to go. Now, can, can I tell you... When you go to them, this is not a boxing match, right? This is not a, uh, this is not I'm going to slash your tires if they don't tell me what I want. This is me going to them and saying, you know, this really hurt. That, that, I, I don't know if you meant it, but it really hurt. And just explain to them, you know, the, what you said, the actions, this, this really hurt. Giving them the opportunity to respond. Now, some of them, when you go to them that are offended, you know what they're going to say? That's not my problem. Now, can I warn you, every party is going to want to swing back, all right? Every, when you go to somebody, because it's not easy. What God is telling us to do here is not easy, all right? The moment you go to somebody and you say, that really hurt, the world pins you, oh, you're just, you're just overly sensitive, da, da, da. No, that's what I should do. Go to them and say, hey, this, this let me give you an example. For the Clivers in the back, all right? He's never done this, so I can, as far as I know, if I have, I'm sorry. All right, if you have, okay. Let's say I came back. He, he works at, at night here with his wife cleaning. Let's say someone bumped into him. He goes, did you hear your pastor said, said ah, and, sh and shred me, all right? If he's done that, he's nice enough not to tell me. Thank you, by the way, okay? But if he's done that, and I hear that, I have two options. 
All right? My number one option is to go to Brother McKenna. You and I got to talk about Joe Cliver. He is a problem. We need, you know, right? That's the first option. Is that the healthy one? No. No, Mr. McKenna would help, and then Mr. McKenna would make it better, and he would then go to my cash. And then, all right? And guess what? When we're all done, we can turn Joe Cliver into the greatest monster Ben Salem Baptist Church has ever had. And he probably never did it. Or I can go to him and say, you're fired. No, I'm kidding. I can go to him and say, <laughs> I go to him and say, listen, I heard this. And he may tell me yes, but it may give him an opportunity to explain to me something I did that I don't even know. He may even say, you know what? I'm sorry. Here's the goal. The goal is reconciliation. That's what I'm looking for. Reconciliation. So I go to them. I ask them. I tell them. And then if they repent, you know, I'm sorry. Now I've got So here's what it tells me to do next. Uh, forgive the offender. I think I got ahead because I want to share a couple thoughts here real quick. Here's what some people say. Well, I'm going to wait until they come to me. Remember, that may never happen. Are you willing to allow this to control you forever? I like what Warren Wearsby said. He goes, if a brother or sister does sin against us, we should go a private, loving rebuke. Our tendency might be if you, to be hurt inside or nurse a grudge and then tell others what happened to us. But this is the wrong approach. Speaking the truth in love is the first step towards solving personal differences. Our aim is not to embarrass or hurt the offender, but to encourage him or to him or her to repent. If the offender does not, then we must forgive. Remember what Peter said? Peter came to Jesus and he says, how often? Oh, I'm sorry, look, look, wrong back. So Matthew, Matthew 6, 14. He says, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. So then what am I do to forgive the offender? The premise is reconciliation. And then the second one is peace in my life. I don't have to live in this pain. I should just offer the forgiveness. In a second, we'll talk about it. It's not as easy as it sounds, all right? But he says, if they repent. Then he says this. He goes, well, what if he sins against me seven times that day? Now, I got, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid to ask this question. I was going to ask the question, how many of you have had somebody offend you the seven times the same way? Some of you say, if you knew my husband, all right? So I won't ask the question. But it's a theoretical question. More than likely, someone hasn't purposely gone out to get you seven times in one day. The premise is that Jesus is saying, as they come, as often as they come, I should be willing and ready to offer forgiveness. Go back and talk to them. What's going on? Now, here's a great bit of advice. If they continue to do that, get away. Right? Don't trust them. Wonder what's going on. Choose a better friend or something. But there is a point where there's some wisdom. Be careful. But I like what Peter, Peter said in Matthew 18, 21. Then came Peter to him, to Jesus and so, Lord, how often shall thy brother sin against me, and I forgive him? So seven times he was sounding perfect, right? Jesus said unto him, I say unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven, uh, a lot. The whole principle comes down to this. I, my only thing I can do is offer that level of forgiveness. That's all I can do. Because when I offer that level of forgiveness, I heal myself. I heal myself. Over the last, it would be 19 years now, I've had the privilege to work with teens. I've had the privilege to pastor. And it's an amazing privilege. And I've had the privilege to counsel throughout those 19 years. You know what has come to my mind? If you've been in premarital counseling with me in the last couple years, you'll know this. My first session is dealing with the trash, dealing with what's bad. You know why? Because so many of us are still so heavily consumed with the past. By the way, let me, let, me, let me explain something. This is, it's a heavy topic, so I'm going to try to explain. I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty about this because we all struggle with it. I'm not saying if you, if you don't forgive, you're a horrible, evil person. You're going to miss out on some things. I, I'm, I'm not trying to feel guilt trip here, please. It being a heavier topic, I hope you understand this. I hope you understand that this is not even about the person that hurt me. This is about me enjoying the freedom and the grace that God has given to me. Enjoying a grace-filled life of freedom and peace and not allowing something truly bad that happened so many years ago to still consume me now at my age. I can be free from that. I don't have to let that person, and now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, well, then I'm going to forgive them. We're going to become best friends. I, I never said that. Right? Hopefully reconciliation is the goal, 
But forgiveness is one thing. Building trust is a very different thing. When they've hurt you, they've got to regain trust. But the point is that I am willing to say, I'm not going to let that person's mistake, anger, whatever it is, control and consume me. Marriages are destroyed by this. Homes are destroyed by this because of something that we're not willing to acknowledge. We're not willing to deal with. And when it's dealt with, we don't want to. So let me ask this question. What do you do if you go to someone and they're not willing to acknowledge it? You, you confronted them. That never happened. Or this or that or this or that. A couple of thoughts. Number one, that's all you can do. Move on. Now it's on their side. And if they choose to do nothing about it, that is their choice. It's wrong. We see it in Scripture. It's wrong. They're never going to be able to reconcile as God intends it to, but that is their choice. And they can say, well, I don't think it's this way. I don't. We are so busy being right that we can't have a right relationship. You catch this? In America, we are so busy being right that we run away from each other in anger. Is hurting all these people and constantly being in pain worth being right? And just saying, you know what, I'm sorry. It's amazing how powerful those words are. You could gain something that God wants you to have, and Satan wants you to live in anger and bitterness and all this, and as long as you got that, Satan's got a hold of you. And you're missing out on the joy that God wants to give to you. You say, but pastor, this is impossible. That's why Jesus goes on. And the disciples in verse 3, teach us more faith. Interesting context. Why? We can't do this. You know what he's saying? And he's right. You can't do this on your own. There's no way you can do what God has said in these verses on your own. It's impossible. I need the power of God in my life. But Jesus says, listen, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move a tree, a deeply planted tree, and it'll obey you. Which means if you live and walk in the grace of God and you allow him to mature you, you can come to the point where you can do what Jesus has said here. One of the most impossible tasks. You see, why is it impossible? Because forgiveness is very anti-my nature. I don't want to forgive. I want to hold it over people. Because when I forgive, I'm letting them get away with the hurt. And no, I, I'm letting myself enjoy some freedom. I'm going to read a couple thoughts. Again, from Warren Reesby, one of my favorite authors. He says this, mature Christians understand that forgiveness is not a cheap exchange of words. The way squabbling children often flippantly say I'm sorry to each other. True forgiveness always involves pain. Somebody has been hurt and there is a price to pay in the healing wound. Love motivates us to forgive, but faith activates that forgiveness so that God can use us to work blessings in the lives of his people. You see, forgiveness is a test of both our faith and our love. It goes against our nature. And that's why Jesus says, I need his strength. Can I tell you? I can, you can hear a preacher talk for an hour, two, three, about hurt and forgiveness, and you can walk away and say, I don't want to do anything with it. You can do that. Because for the, the hurt inside is real and it's valid and it's eating you up. And, and, and it's some, some scenarios, it's become so much part of you, you're afraid to give it up because you don't know who you'll be without it. And I'm not trying to be rude. I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. It, it, it's consumed us so much, we don't even realize until this point, maybe in this message, how much control it has. You know what I've had to learn in the area of forgiveness? And I tell you what. One of the things that preachers get nervous about is, well, you're preaching. You must be good at this. No, no, I just had to study this. This is just the next part in Luke. No, nope. but I work at it. I work hard at it. There was a time in my life, I remember sitting in a message, and a preacher got up and preached on bitterness. And I remember thinking, got this. I can sleep through this one. Having no idea it was the one message I needed that week. I didn't know. And when I got that right, it absolutely changed my life. It was a lightness and a, and, and a freedom. Well, what happened? Did it still hurt? Did it matter? See, I, I can go back and tell you what it was that hurt me. And don't be careful, because the moment you think about it, you start to get angry again, right? And I, I can tell you, and I can create a story that will make you hate those people just as much, all right? We can do that. Or I can say, you know, God showed me that day what I needed to do. 
and I did it. And I have enjoyed peace in that part of my life. That's what God wants to offer here. Givers of grace, those who say, I want to show the world grace, it must start with forgiveness, and here's why. If I'm not willing to forgive, I will never be able to go and be what God wants me to be because I'm held back by Satan. What did Paul say? Forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth. As long as I'm held by an anchor of anger, anchor of, of, uh, anchor of bitterness or something, valid struggles, as long as that holds me back, I will not be able to move forward as God wants me to. It's not easy, but boy, it's something that can change my life. Can, can I give you one thought? I don't like to usually say because God did, but can I encourage you? You say it's hard to forgive. But then there was a Jesus who hung up on the cross and forgives you every day, even though he knows your heart. Forgives you every day. I would encourage you. I don't know what's in your situation. One of the things I love about expositional preaching is when you preach a, what we consider a heavier topic, I don't have to point it to anybody. This is the next section in Luke. But I believe something that in our lives, I know what this has been in mind, it's easy to control us if we're not careful. Would you allow God to help you to offer something that only comes from God's strength that can give you a freedom. Father, we are grateful for the privilege that you've given to us.